Okay, welcome to the first session of the first Paris Lexington Adult Programs Committee Tuesday afternoon speaker series. And we won't say that mouthful again. Um, we're just so pleased that our beloved and super talented music director, Rip Jackson, is the um, kickoff speaker. And I've um, dubbed his talk mentor magic but that was my <laughs> my idea uh, before we go to that though there are a few housekeeping details first of all the structure is going to be a little flexible but we're assuming somewhere around 20 minutes of presentation and up to 30 minutes of discussion or activity or however this particular presenter wants to do it but we are flexible <clears throat> and I will be a somewhat of a timekeeper. We will end no later than 5.30. I've already indicated that your, your participation is vital, um, particularly when you have questions or comments. And um, until you do though, please keep yourselves muted and then unmute. If you have a comment or question, we ask you to use the raise hand option, which you go to um, reactions, the reactions button at the bottom right of your screen, hit it, and then you'll see you just press raise hand. And then when you're done, you lower it, you press it again and you lower your hand. If you can't do that, um, various of us are going to scan for real hands up in your, in your uh, pictures. <clears throat> I wanted to thank everybody who's helped make this possible, at least this time around. Um, first, Omar, who's our tech, tech meister for his generous support. Don Cohen, who were, was my partner in the initial creation of this series. To all the adult program committee members, Dave Horton kind of counts, and especially Ruth Rose, who has done yeoman work on publicity. And I hope that you'll all be able to set aside this time every week. We have a wonderful array of our fellow parishioners and a really varied program. So I hope you'll just set it aside. Next week, um, Katie O'Hare Gibson is going to talk about how her UU faith sustained her through her first year as a school administrator during the pandemic. And it still does, of course. So now back to Rip. I have a question. Is anybody in this group? There's nobody here who doesn't know Rip, right? Okay. So <laughs> I don't need to say anything too much, and I want to get right to him. I'll just say that <clears throat> um, the short, the short version is he is a man of many extraordinary musical, dance, creative, academic, and impresario talents and experience. And you'll learn more about all these, um, all about these as he shares with us his stories of mentors in his life. So welcome again, Rick. We're so excited you're here. Thank you, Meg. Um, for my first, uh, before I get started, I just want to ask, um, can you all hear me well? Just give me a thumbs up. Okay, great. Um, so I'm just so happy to join you and I can't think of a more um, important for my life topic than to share with you how my life really um, how I evolved to be the director of music at your church and how mentoring um, really was just vital. I wouldn't be here if it hadn't happened. And I, I feel so lucky that there were people in my life who redirected me in the right direction. Um, and I feel like to share this story with you without the um, background of how I developed as a human being would be only half the story. Um, so I'm going to be very um, transparent with you all uh, about some struggles that I have gone through, especially when I was a youngster, and how these people 
broke through my um, walls and barriers and helped me become the person that I am. Um, I, uh, so I'm going to be pretty honest with you about my life, um, and I, I will try really hard to keep it uh, timely. <laughs> so um, I think a lot, and if you know me well, and if you've gotten to know me on a more of a personal level, you're probably aware that just like everybody, I have insecurities and, um, you know, we're all human and no one's perfect and everybody's got issues. But um, I think people would be very surprised if they knew just how um, how challenging my early years were. Um, and uh, it's, uh, in some ways, I think it's such a miracle that I was able to come through as well as I feel like I have come through. Um, I don't think, I think I could have very easily gone down a different direction. Um, and uh, so I'm just gonna share just a little bit about what, before I met my first mentor, and I basically have, there are four people in my life that stand out over everyone. And uh, the first person I met was um, a guy named Billy, well, we called him Billy Densmore, but his name was William. Um, Densmore and um, when he met me I was a 13 year old and he came to my eighth grade school he he um, he had started a performing arts high school in Atlanta and it was the first integrated magnet school in the entire south uh, in in the, in the segregated south and he was able to integrate and um, he got a lot of support from Coretta Scott King and um, he was just he's a trailblazer of a guy and um, my mother thought it'd be really cool if I auditioned for the performing arts high school because I was already starting to um, really gravitate towards um, especially music first. And so um, that's where my story begins and I'll just kind of tell you who this 13 year old was. Um, it, it, it may be a little shocking to you, but um, I was a um, um, extremely shy um, to the point of um, didn't have really have any friends. Um, I uh, had very, very, very chronic low self-esteem and I had suffered some unfortunately abuse issues and things of that nature. And um, like for me, the escape was music. Like it was like a, an unbelievably beautiful world that I could just let go of all my problems and, and um, so that's that's where the story starts, um, and uh, I think I started playing the piano when I was about seven, and um, uh, so when I when Mr. Densmore came to me, uh, he came to my school. My mother signed me up, and he sat at this table, and he just asked me some questions. And um, luckily, I had been in the middle school chorus, and um, uh, had just done really well and gotten, I had terrible grades in everything but music. <laughs> until I was, until my uh, maybe eighth grade, I started to get better grades, but I even was sent to, um, this will be interesting to you, I was sent to a um, therapist at the school because um, the few friends I did have were African American and all the white people in my school thought there was something wrong with that. Um, the, uh, the teacher of the year for my fifth grade, just to give you an example, she was uh, Miss Sutton. She was the teacher of the year for Georgia, and she put a bookshelf between this, the class, and she put the slow learners on one side and the fast learners, that's what her words, all the slow learners, according to her, were African American. Um, you know, so it was a pretty rough, um, in my opinion, environment to grow up in. And on top of that, at the age of um, 13 I was coming into my sexuality and I knew that um, everything about my intimate life would be something to feel a lot of shame about and so you know I was someone just who just didn't feel like I fit in anywhere and I I, I really didn't um, I didn't feel like super talented or anything but I just knew that I enjoyed music and so um, I got into the school for the performing arts and that summer I, uh, the first thing I did was their summer program and it was Jesus Christ Superstar and this show called Pearly. Now, today, 
this would never happen and you're going to be horrified when you hear this but pearly was an was a, a is a show about african americans and um they had all of us white i was a dancer in the show and we had to wear blackface can you believe that of course i was only 13 i didn't know any better and um i guess if i ever ran for president they could show a picture of me and say well rip was in blackface but i didn't know any better at the time um and um but back to staying on track it was a very very awesome intro into the performing arts i was like um yeah i fit in here because i'll tell you um the school i went to it probably had like maybe 1400 kids and um about 60 percent of the kids were in performing arts or maybe 50 to 60. the other kids were just more academic based and um the difference between the two populations could not be more evident in the in the performing arts there was like a lot of like really um I would guess you would call them punk or goth. There was a lot more gay people and they were more like open about being gay. There was more artsy people. There was more nerdy people. And, and then you had the regular population, preppy, popular, cheerleader, sports, all the things that I felt I was less than. I always felt less than in that population. However, you took academics at the beginning of your of the of the day, and then you went to the and then I went to ballet for two classes, and then I went to music theater and chorus for two classes, and then after school I did my homework, and then we had rehearsals in the evening for this thing called the touring show, and it was just this amazing world. And I'll just describe Billy Dinsmore, and I have a picture I can show you of him. Um, in fact, I'm going to do that right now, so you can just kind of. Um, I'm going to share just, okay, well, first of all, um, uh, this is me in high school, <laughs> and there, this is the only real picture I have of Billy Dinsmore. I went and looked uh, in my old photos, and I looked online. He, unfortunately, he passed away before, um, before the, the invention of the internet, and I could not find any pictures, much less of him, so... Anyway, but that was Mr. Dinsmore. Um, he was a Pied Piper. He was someone who could tell people that you can do better than you think you can do. Um, he was bursting with energy, a hard worker. Um, now, he was no saint, and believe me, um, I am very lucky because I guess he, you know, I was a dancer, and so if you're a male dancer, you pretty much can write your ticket. You can be in every show, you're going to get into every fabulous tour, and we toured all over um, Hawaii, California, New York. We did all kinds of exciting things, um, and so I was on his good side. Now, I will tell you that he is no saint, and none of my mentors were. Maybe my dance teacher, she might be a saint. but. Um, Anyway, Billy Densmore just had this amazing ability to, um, I mean, first of all, he just loved music, dance, theater, and he brought it all together and did these amazing performances. Um, I was in Pippin, um, Carmina Barana, uh, West Side Story, so many amazing, The Wiz, I was a dancer in The Wiz, there was, and we did Mozart's Great Mass in C. Um, we did works by Stravinsky. Um, we did the uh, Bernstein Mass, and I mean, he just he really and he he really saw the big picture. He was the director of the whole entire Magnet School of the Arts, and at the time, it was pretty similar to the New York School for the Arts. And I don't know if any of you have seen the movie Fame back in 1980. I just recently watched it, and our school was very much like that. And it was an incredible experience and I just, I wish that I had stayed more in touch with Billy Dinsmore because um, he would have been so, I think he would have been so happy to know what I did because in some ways, and I'm going to share a little bit later what I've done with my life over my adult life, there are a lot of ways that I paralleled him in bringing people into these big productions and and trying to create beautiful performing arts and um, unfortunately he died um, before most of my 
I mean, he died right when I just started working uh, in the Vermont full time and uh, we had kind of lost touch. I had stayed in touch with him for maybe a little bit after high school, but at any rate, he was an outstanding person. He, um, uh, I had, I had a not so great piano teacher, no offense to that person who taught me, but when I was in middle school, uh, that person never pushed me very hard. And, um, I mainly just, honestly, I just did what I was told and, um, I never got pushed hard. And, um, so I went to Mr. Dinsmore and said, Hey, I also play the piano. Did you know that? He's like, no. And so I played the piano for him. We did this like talent show and he, and I played, um, Oh, I think it was the Rachmaninoff prelude in C sharp minor, which I'm sure that all you pianists know that piece. Dun, dun, boom. But anyway, um, he was like, you need to, who's your teacher? And I told him, he was like, oh, no, no, no. You need to study with this lady named Marilyn Walthall. And so now she's, I don't put her in my top four mentors. She was a fantastic piano teacher. She was Robert Shaw's assistant. Uh, and she can, she was the pianist for the Atlanta Symphony Orchestra chorus. She was the organist and the pianist for the Atlanta Symphony Orchestra. And she taught Robert Shaw's kids. So we were all in the same piano studio together and did recitals together all the time. And if it wasn't for Billy Dinsmore, that would have never happened. And he actually, for my <clears throat> junior and senior year of college, um, I was I did really well academically. And he he convinced my principal to let me have one whole period where I could just practice piano, which was pretty amazing because he knew I was doing homework after school and also trying to do ballet and then do his his shows at night. And I didn't have any time to practice piano. And, and he's like, oh, I can I can find a way to get you an hour to practice during the day. So he's amazing just an amazing guy so he is pretty much my first most amazing mentor now pretty quickly into my time at Northside School for the Arts um, I was very interested in dance I had just always loved dance and even when I was young I would just for fun dance around the house I just always loved to dance and so when I did uh, Jesus Christ Superstar in the summer of 1979 my choreographer was a, na a lady named Lee Harper and I'll share a picture with you of her okay so so that's Lee Harper and she was as the as it shows here she was a uh, member of the Alvin Ailey dance company um, and she moved to Atlanta, Georgia, because Robert Shaw asked her to choreograph the Bernstein Mass in Atlanta. So they, because she was in the original Bernstein Mass at, at the Kennedy Center with Center Kennedy Center with um, the Alvin Ailey Dance Company. And so she brought the, she was able to bring that knowledge and, and create this amazing production for Robert Shaw. And she basically ended up setting up a uh, dance company in Atlanta, and she was the main choreographer for the performing arts. Now, we had five or six dance professionals in the performing arts, and they were all amazing. We even had an African dance lady, Mrs. Sullivan. We had jazz. We had modern. We had ballet. Uh, Mr. Stanley, and he was from Russia, actually, and um, he was a Russian ballet dancer. So, but she took a liking to me like she I was not I wouldn't say I was a great dancer when she first um, saw me but like I was determined to somehow get better and um, so that first so I danced in Jesus Christ Superstar and I the, I know there's a video somewhere but I would love to see me dancing in that show but anyway she, um, in the ninth grade, she asked me, hey, would you like to come take dance at my studio? And at the time, um, my parents were unwilling, no offense to them, but they just, they just were like, um, what do you want to pay for dance? You know, that's, uh, so, so I was like, well, um, I really can't afford it. And she was like, just, do you want to vacuum my floor, my floors say tonight? I'm like, sure. So five days a week, I went to Lee Harper Studios and I was dancing with, professionals from New York who had come down to Atlanta um, and I was starstruck and I was just it was magical like I've tried to recreate that magic as an adult I don't know I think I just the stars kind of came together but she believed in me and she knew that I was struggling she knew that I was socially awkward she knew that I was just 
um, did not have a lot of confidence. And she really, really let me know that I could do anything I wanted to. And I cannot tell you, I cannot tell you how much she really almost parented me, to be honest with you. Now, Billy Ginsmore didn't parent me. He was tough. She was positive and loving. And I, I, I think they each had, I mean, this is very sexist, but Billy was like a fatherly kind of person, and she was very motherly towards me. And just as an aside, not only did she nurture me in high school, um, when I graduated from college, I was kind of, I went through a crisis, and I was like, I'm not very talented. I just don't think I should be in music. I'm going to go back into math or science. And she said, well, um, that's really nice, but why don't you come teach piano at my dance studio? And she had hundreds and hundreds of kids who wanted to take piano. And so she had a piano brought to her studio uh, and had a little room for me. And all and like I was on a waiting list because everybody wanted to take piano because they all knew me as a dancer. And um, I, you know, and I also played piano for her when she did big recitals and concerts. She asked me, so she really helped me believe that I could do anything. Um, and I just, um, thankfully, she's still alive. She's still dancing. She's, I would say, maybe in her late seventies, and she's e even after a hip replacement and knee replacement, she is a fantastic dancer. Um, somewhere I couldn't find it, but I have a picture because at the age of fifty-two, I went back and took dance from her when I was just in Atlanta, and she was just she was practically in tears, and all of her dancers. It, from her professional company where I just got to come take a company dance class and she just I was just so happy that I got to reconnect with her and we've stayed in touch through Facebook um, she's a wonderful dancer she also introduced me to liturgical dance in churches so she really really inspired me really excellent dancer so that's my second mentor um, the third mentor had nothing to do well not really anything to do with the performing arts, but um, my third mentor was a lady named Rosemary Lockhart. Rosemary uh, was my English teacher. Now, I always did well in math and science. I did terrible in English and social studies. Now, oddly enough, I now love history, but at the time, for whatever reason, I didn't, um, I did, my father was a sort of a pretty pretty amazing writer he wrote novels and um, I never really read books and he just kind of thought that I just that, you know rip that's just not your thing English is not your thing and I was like okay I'm just not a good writer I'm not a good reader um, and Rosemary's like no that's not true <laughs> so I walked into her class in the 11th grade now just to let you know I was in the slow learning English class in 9th and 10th grade so um, I really performed poorly on the standardized test um, but unbeknownst to the teachers, it was not because I didn't want to read or, or wasn't interested in being a good writer. I didn't think I had any potential. And so I, um, I struggled. But Rosemary, um, from the very, I, re, I still remember to this day, the first, I, I went and sat at my desk. And I just think she knew by the way I was holding myself, by the, the look on my face, I think she knew that I felt embarrassed because I think I, by the end of the 10th grade, they had bumped me up to norm. I don't know. I think they called it average English. It was not above average English. It wasn't, it wasn't, you know, uh, any of the like advanced, but it was, um, I was in the average class, <laughs> which I was nervous about. I was like, oh my gosh, they're putting me with people who do normal. And so I think she could just tell that I did not have the self-esteem. And she totally inspired me. One day she brought into her class an actress. And this actress portrayed Gertrude Stein and Emily Dickinson. And she had this little, um, like that Chinese little thing. And she went behind it and she came out. And she was this stern, really you know, powerful lady, Gertrude Stein, and she read some of her, or she from, recited from memory, and I was just like enthralled. And then she went back and she put on this 19th century dress and, and all of a sudden she came out and she was like Emily Dickinson. And I got really excited about poetry and novels. And Rosemary 
this this story continues, and I'm I'm running out of time. I can't tell you all the things, but um, so by the end of my eleventh grade, Rosemary not only helped me become a decent writer and a really good reader of literature, but she also um, uplifted my arts. She was an absolute patron of the arts, and she the next year she started at Northside this class called the Humanities. Now, um, nothing like that had existed at our school, and I don't even know if they teach it anymore, but it basically was two whole periods for a whole year, and you studied ancient Greek, art, philosophy, um, history, architecture, all the way through the Roman era, the Middle Ages, the Renaissance. So all of a sudden, for my senior year, I got this amazing, like, perspective. Oh, Mozart wrote in the 18th century. Oh, Bach was a Baroque composer. And there's these gorgeous Rococo churches and romanticism. And uh, she just helped me see the whole picture. And she took us to the Spoleto Festival in uh, Charleston, South Carolina. She took us to Williamsburg. We went to uh, we went camping on the Appalachian Trail in North Georgia and, and, and read transcendental poetry. Um, she was remarkable. Let me show you a picture of her so you can you can get a picture with the face or face with the picture. Oops, there's Rosemary. Um, and uh, she, so before I forget, um, there's me dancing in the front row with a little bow tie. <laughs> That's the Bernstein mass. So uh, Lee Harper um, brought me to. Um, brought, as you know, the Bernstein Master of the Atlanta Symphony Orchestra, and then Billy Dinsmore did it at the Northside School for the Arts, and I was one of the lead dancers. Um, so, at any rate, so, um, Rosemary pretty much, she, um, I, I don't want to say there, that she was inappropriate, but we were, she was a friend to me, and I don't, you know, I mean, I don't think you do that now, but, I mean, I'm just going to be, this is a honest lecture here or conversation she befriended me you know she came over to my parents house she took me out to dinner and she just was like so incredibly like kind to me and loving and um she uh stayed in touch with me over the years and she was incredibly supportive of me and she was a, she published poetry and uh, sadly she she passed away in 2009 but um she was amazing and I my life would not I wouldn't be where I was right now if she had not saw this poor little kid and you guys probably don't you may not perceive me this way but if you knew me in high school um, I really really struggled with a lot and she did she did magic I like your word Meg mentor it was magical what she did I have one more mentor to share with you, and then we'll open it up to questions. But um, so, so for my after I finished high school, um, I actually um, didn't think about going into music um, for some reason. Um, I will say that um, I was way better of a ballet dancer than I was a pianist in high school. I I did practice the piano, but I was obsessed with ballet, and I really, really was on. I was on a trajectory to doing ballet, I think, but unfortunately, in my senior year of high school, I hurt my knee. I was doing a professional dance comp, um, performance, and um, actually, I got paid to dance. It was really cool. I was in commercials. I was in shows. I got to do all this really cool stuff, And but um, I, I twisted my knee in a very bad way, and it really, it tore all the ligaments in my left knee. And I did finally, I, I couldn't walk for a month, and for three months, I couldn't dance. And I was able to dance, and then the next year, when I was back in the ballet rigorous, I, I could dance pretty well, but I could not do the jumps. And if you're a male dancer, you have to be able to jump. You have to be able to jump all the, all the time, and it, it really kind of hurt my knee to jump, so I knew my dance career was done. And um, so... When I graduated from college, I was like, okay, well, I'm going to go to Georgia Tech and maybe, you know, do something in the sciences or math or physics or something. And I was miserable there. And I practiced the piano almost eight hours a day at Georgia Tech. I was in, there was a piano in the basement of the dorm and people kept complaining because I was practicing all the time. But I, I just practiced the piano eight hours a day and I got pretty decent. 
And finally, I realized I, I can't go. I, I've got to be in music. I've got to be in the performing arts. And I went to Florida State the next year. And here's where my last mentor that I'm going to share with you. His name is Jeffrey Kite Powell. Um, I will show you real quickly a picture. I'm probably going to scroll, scroll through some funny pictures to get to him. But so there's me dancing. There's Rosemary. Oh, there's Dr. Kite Powell. His name is Jeffrey Kite Powell. And uh, his wife, his name is Helga Kite Powell. And um, he was one of the first people I met at Florida State. When I showed up to the campus, um, I was just walking through the music school. Now, the Florida State Music School is huge. It's not as big as Indiana University's music school, but it's a very fantastic program. And um, I walked into the school. And by the way, Rosemary had turned me on to medieval and Renaissance music. And I was obsessed by listening to medieval and Renaissance music, ancient music. And so I walked in through the halls of Florida State and there was a poster. And in that poster was come sing madrigals and medieval organum and sing masses by Guillaume de Machaut. And I was like, I'm in. Now, unbeknownst to me, that was Jeffrey Kite Powell's first day at work too. We both showed up at Florida State the same year. He had transferred from some other university in, in Florida, and he was an expert on Renaissance, medieval and Renaissance music. He Today, he's one of the foremost experts in the world on performing Renaissance music. And he, um, he so I walked into his office and I said, can I be one of the Madrigal singers? <laughs> and he looked at his assistant and they were like, this kid is really excited about because they were having to go like drag kids into making vocal majors, like making it a requirement to sing because a lot of kids wouldn't show sign up for it. And I was like, the first day I was hooked, I'm like, I want to be a, a madrigal singer. And um, he uh, he's an extraordinary teacher. Um, his he built one of the biggest early music programs of any school in the country. Um, he and he had sackbut ensembles, viol de gambas. Um, Baroque instruments, madrigal singers, medieval ensembles. I mean, he did it all. And he would put these concerts on that were astounding. I have a picture of me and my first concert with him. And this is actually the very first time he said, Hey, Rip, you're a pianist. Why don't you try playing a harpsichord? I'm like, what's that? I mean, well, that's not true. I knew what a harpsichord was, but I'd never played one. I'd seen them. I'd never put my hands on one. I knew he had one in the, like he had this big studio and he was like, Oh, it's just like playing the piano. You know, you'll get used to it. And so he showed me some things and here's a picture of me playing the harpsichord. There's a little light covering my head over there, but that's that was my first experience playing a harpsichord, and he put me in a Renaissance costume, and this was my there. You can actually see Dr. Kite Powell. He's to, four people to the right of me playing a recorder there with the beard. Um, so, um, any rate, um, the four years I got to spend with him were amazing. Um, I will tell you that um, he helped me um, really learn to love history and um, I ended up getting a joint degree in piano performance and music history and I um, there's not time to tell you but I had a crisis in school and he saw me through that crisis and he's like rip I was basically when I had to write my thesis for my undergraduate I'm like I'm not a good writer I can't do this I need to I need to change de degrees or something or maybe drop out he's like no you can do this and every chapter that I wrote, he sat down with me and he read it. And he said, this is why, oh, Rip, you're, he taught me more. He took over where Rosemary had stopped. And he actually taught me to be a better, more academic writer. I can't thank him enough. He's since moved up here. Now he lives in on the South Shore b below Boston. And um, I get to see him sometimes. And um, I'm out of time, but I could tell you many more interesting stories. But... Um, I will share you a couple quick pictures and then I'm going to close up here. I will say that um, what I've tried to do as an adult now is be mentors to others. Um, and any time I see, I, you can ask Mary because she saw me in Vermont. Um, I seem to, especially kids who are troubled, I think they know 
that I'm very sensitive to that. I think they can sense that I have a nurturing personality because I know what it's like to feel less than. And so I, I feel like my whole calling in life is to help people see that they can do things they don't think they could, and especially young people. I'm just gonna share a couple quick pictures with you, and then I promise I'll give you a chance to ask some questions. Okay, so, so this is just some of the things I did and all of this is because of the mentors. Um, every year I put on a Messiah performance in Vermont. Um, so there's just a picture of our Messiah. Um, I did opera. This was my first opera I conducted. Um, West Side Story. This was Jesus Christ Superstar in 2003. Um, of course, I was in it with Lee Harper being my choreographer and Billy Dinsmore being my stage director. And that was back in 1980 no 1979 and uh but i've gone on to both music cho choreograph and stage direct jesus christ superstar among many other things this was the bernstein mass in rutland vermont and um what makes me so so happy about this is that um it's an incredibly difficult work to to bring together and um i Feel like I was honoring Lee Harper and the Alvin Ailey Dance Company in my own production of it. You probably recognize Maris Wolf in the front there, who who did our Misa Gaia. And this is an original work I wrote for, um, kind of based on the Bernstein Mass, but my own creation, the Beatitudes, which was a two-hour theater work with the orchestra and choir. You can only see some of the participants, and that's. Oh, and here's our Misa Gaia at First Parish that we did in 2018. Now, if the pandemic hadn't come along, there would have been for sure, um, uh, I would be, we would be continue our theater. And I, I want to assure you that that's next on my agenda to bring that back. So thank you for listening to my story. And I'm happy to um if you have some curiosity or questions or if you want me to delve deeper into any part of the story i'm all ears this really is magic what you're talking what you're talking about and what you are passing on yes thank you so deb so weiner let's see some so, hands. yeah deb weiner soul has a question rip thank you so much it's really fabulous to see this and to listen to your stories I wonder if uh, if you were to identify the single most fulfilling project that you have been involved in, what would it be and why? Thank That's you. That's a really good question. Hmm. <laughs> you know, it's funny when when Meg asked me to speak today, you know, she talked to me, I think it was in December. Part of me was like, I'm, like, I'm happy to do it, but I'm like, oh, I don't want to brag about myself. I don't want to be egotistical. I don't want to just talk about myself. But I will say that getting a chance to write a theater work of my, that where I got to let my creativity, basically the Beatitudes, the, the church I worked for, they gave me a, a whole um, six months off where all I just really reduced all my requirements and I was able to really just compose all day and collaborate with my lyricist and the, with, with um, Maris on the choreography and the theater work. Um, being able to compose and also to bring to fruition, I mean, I, Jesus Christ as a teacher of compassion and love and as someone who wanted to protect the marginalized, um, being able to uplift his beatitudes in a way that um, combined my spirituality with my music and my creativity so, and the performing arts, I would say, and I, so I do have a video of me because I got a 10 minute standing ovation and people wouldn't stop cheering. And so, um, and even my parents were there. And um, I just, I could, I, you know, at one point the videographer decided to just focus on me and you, I'm just sitting there crying. I think that little boy who just didn't think he mattered um, with, with, with enough nurturing and, and, and self-esteem and, and the love of, at the time that Congregation Vermont was so loving to me. And um, 
I would say that was just like the highlight of my life. Now, I, I'm dreaming about another work, and this time I'd like it to be based on Unitarianism in some way, because I, I embraced, while I was working for a Christian church, the Christian spirituality, but now I want to embrace some other topic that's very deep and, and important to Unitarians, so I don't feel like I'm done with that yet. Helen. Rip. I see your hand, Helen. Yes, okay. Rip, I, I know that I'm like probably everybody else here. There's no way I can express to you what you mean to us, what you've given us. I've watched the whole congregation grow in a sense of music and community and celebration and joy through what you've done. And um, we are just so blessed by what you've done. What, when you didn't talk about your spirituality in, in this, uh, but I do know that it's very central to what you're doing. Um, can you just say a few words about how that got to be? And if you are willing to do Unitarian spirituality, I'd love to help. <laughs> Absolutely. When I, yeah, of course, yes, call me. Um, so I, um, so just, I'll just tell you a quick aside. Um, when I was in high, I, w I was unchurched growing up. Now, my family came from a Baptist background, but my parents didn't go to church and my grandmother didn't go to church. Um, and I, to be honest with you, I'm kind of grateful because if we had in the South, I might have gotten molded into a very rigid person because friends of mine who were very into church back then um, got very indoctrinated into a, a, a system that I'm not comfortable with. And I'm just honestly thankful. Having said that, my parents, there was a Presbyterian church in um, where I grew up near the house and my parents dumped us off at Sunday school and also children's choir. And eventually, like my children's choir director was like, you read music. At, at 11 years old, I could read music because I played the piano. She was like, do you want to sing in the soprano section of the adult choir? I'm like, I would love to because I was getting really bored by this just simple music. And so I sang in the choir for three years at the Presbyterian Church. And um, my first solo was um, as a boy soprano there. So I, I was introduced to Christianity there. I also had a boyfriend in high school who was a fundamentalist Christian. He told me I was going to go to hell if I didn't get baptized. So I went and got baptized at a, thankfully, a more liberal Disciples of Christ. They dunked me in the water, and I went in the back and had to blow dry my hair, and the minister had to come say, the, we can hear the blow dryer in the surf. <laughs> anyway, so, um, <laughs> but I had big hair, you see. So, um, sorry about the focus, but anyway, so, I went through a lot of different stages, but I even as an adult, I knew that the best part of Christianity for me was the essence of it. I read a book by Jimmy Carter where he talks about how you really should read the Bible, and it's not about all the these little details on the surface. It's the depth of it, and, and there is a beautiful depth to Christianity. And to this day, I think that most of that beautiful music applies to all of us but but i have always been interested in other religions and also just embracing secular music it, it has its own secular spiritualism to me is very powerful it's this belief that um that we are greater together than apart it's this belief that the universe is a loving beautiful healing place where we can all have the opportunity to thrive and and so um you know, I had a chance to either go into academia or Broadway, or I had lots of people steering me like, hey, Rip, you would be great. And, you know, you, you, do you want to be a, a orchestral conductor? Do you, you do that a lot? So I could have gone to, into any of those fields, um, but I, what was lacking from those fields was the spirituality for me. The other, the other component to that is the multi-generational. And there's there's no other place but churches there there might be some community centers where it happens a little bit but the magic of spirit and intergenerationalism is in churches and everything i do to me is about finding the underlying spirit and finding a way for us to connect you know 
I'm going to be honest with you. I've worked in the professional early music field. I've worked um, uh, in the professional theater world. It can be very backstabbing. And that's because in some ways it's ego driven. And, and believe me, I, we all have egos, but I'm trying to get my ego out of this and I want it to be spirit driven. Thank you, Helen. That was a good question. All the questions are going to be great, I'm sure. I um, unmute, please. You need to unmute. Elsie, Elsie, yeah, thank you. I'm going to tell her to ask her to unmute. There she is. Well, I Omar, can you unmute her? To, can you unmute her? I don't think so. There she is. Okay. Um, Tell us how First Parish was lucky enough to get you. <laughs> Omar, do you want to tell that story? No. <laughs> Omar was Omar and Meg, by the way, Omar and Meg were the two people I first met at First Parish. I Meg and me. Oh, and, and Ruth. Ruth. I yes. Was That's right. But the, I think Meg might have been the first person I talked to. Yeah. I was hiking on the Appalachian Trail and it just happened to have cell service and we had a wonderful conversation. Um, I did a search. Um, I loved my time in Vermont, um, but I'll be honest with you. It was a huge job and a huge church and a huge pro huge, huge. And Vermont is the most gorgeous state, but it's so far from, um, I mean, I was a single person and it's very hard if, if you're gay to date in Vermont. I mean, I didn't move here just to find a boyfriend, but but I felt very isolated, to be honest with you. And um, I also um, I also was wanting maybe a little bit of a smaller. I wanted to start to have a good work life balance, and I really just couldn't do it in that job. The other thing is, I wanted to work for a Unitarian church. I really, really wanted to work for a Unitarian church. I'm not going to tell you where, but there was a couple other jobs that were that I could have potentially taken. Um, but what I liked about First Parish um, was the size, um, and I saw potential at First Parish that needed to be built up. I, I felt, and I mean, I could have already gone to an already established program. That would be fine, but... I'm every single church job I've ever taken, I I have been smaller programs that have grown over the years. And I and there's something very wonderful and inspirational, exciting to be able to have the ability. It's kind of like, you know, it's it'd be like me being a gardener and going to a garden where someone's already planted all the flowers. It's like, well, okay, so I just need to, you know, just watch it grow. It's already grown. But it was just, I could tell that there was a lot of opportunity, so I was excited. Um, and I, I um, very much liked the energy of the search committee. And that's, I'm an energy person, so like, just to give an example, in one of the other jobs that was courting me and that was in a big Unitarian church, they were kind of stuffy. <laughs> they were stuffy and a little intimidating. I'm like, no, that doesn't feel right to me. Um, and First Parish, from day one, People were extremely loving towards me. Ruth, I'm going to call on you, but may I just say um, for the record, that call to you on the Appalachian Trail was also magical. <laughs> and it was pretty clear after that call that I was going to be one of your boosters. <laughs> well, I'm so grateful. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Okay, Ruth. So I just want to say, so Meg and I were on the committee and um, I had been in the choir for a number of years previously, but I had kind of dropped out of that. Um, and so <laughs> for each candidate we had, uh, we sort of got a few people together to be the choir that the candidate would work with for an evening. And we were able 
well, the whole choir numbered 12 and, or maybe even 10, because Meg and I decided we better go. And so after that evening, we said, oh, you know, I like what he's, what he's doing. And um, then after Rip started coming, you know, we said, you know, we really should support Rip by going to choir practice. And so we did, and we were hooked. And I think inside of a year, uh, choir, the choir jumped to 30 people. And I'm not sure what our roster is today. It might be like 35. And also people like Mary and some other folks from Vermont would come down to sing with us. And I, I thought that was a great testament to Rip. Um, and I must say, Rip has turned the choir into this really loving community of people. And your um, experience in English and literature um, also has served you well in the readings you choose. And um, it's really quite um, gratifying. You've done, you've done a lot with us. So thank it's you. Been an amazing, amazing, and and I feel so positive about the church. Um, you know, I think we've we're all aware that we have some struggles. Every church does, and um, the pandemic has just you know turned us upside down. But we're going to get through this, and I you know I try not to be. I really am not a competitive person. I, I want every church to to flourish, but I do have friends in, in in other. I look at some of the other programs, and we're you know I mean as a whole church we're doing pretty well. We've got a great Zoom numbers. The choirs, the, the kids' choirs, still going, you know, and we have such a huge body of people who care deeply about this place, and that's a winning combination. That is a winning combination. The capital campaign fund is going strong. And we will get through this pandemic and um, we'll just pick up where we left off. And I think there's going to, I actually think just like, you know, they talk about the, 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 the plague sort of ushering in the Renaissance on a macro scale in Europe. You know, it actually, there was some silver lining to it. I think for our society, having something like this, it's going to hit the reset button and I, you know, people will go, hey, what, what really matters to me? I haven't been able to, you know, do the arts or, or spirituality or fellowship or connection for two and a half years. I think people are going to be more in. I really do. I think people are going to be coming to our church more. Um, and so I see this as a great opportunity when we open our doors again to, to flourishing even more. Um, yeah, I, I saw Pete's hand and and we only have a very few minutes but um Pete, do you want to ask a question as the last person here's somebody who's one of who has devoted so much of himself to this kind of, this community well i just wanted to make sure that the um the youth choir that that rip grew from from nothing um has been instrumental in attracting families to first parish um and i have to share another thing that was pretty important to us um, during the search for uh, Reverend Ann. Um, there were a lot of people in the church who um, said, I don't care what you get search committee, but I don't want another gay man. <laughs> and I want a woman who's got five kids or four kids and is heterosexual and has a happy husband. And, and Rip was in one of these uh, talkback meetings that the search committee had. And he said, well, I just want to tell you that I can deal with young kids, that I, I love young kids and I, and I, can, I can get them to, um, to be something special to this church. And it was, it was a much more effective way of trying to counter that argument than having us old white guys talk about, you know, yeah, that, that was something else. <laughs> Thank you, Rip. 
Thank you, Pete. I'm glad you brought up, I know we're about to end, but I have to tell you, to me, the most important ministry of my job here is the children's choir. Um, and I'm not going to lie to you, it's been challenging, partly because of the pandemic and partly just because we haven't had, at any rate, we just haven't had a strong, big program that I could draw from. And so it's right, you know, at a, t at a, a couple of years ago, you know, we had 15 to 18 kids showing up on Sunday mornings and all those parents, you know, are sitting there getting to know each other and they're pretty good friends. And um, it's, of course, the pandemic is, it sucks. <laughs> so, but, but the kids have not given up. And I just want you to know, we had our first, I was, the kids were very disappointed. They're so happy that we were starting to meet again um, last fall, but then we went back to Zoom and we had a really good turnout of kids, super enthusiastic. They know this is short term. We will get the kids choir back in, in play. And a, a year or two down the line with a strong RE person in there, I'm hoping to have a high school choir too. I, I don't see why this church cannot have a high school choir, um, but we do have to have another program that kind of caters to that demographic. But, but it is, in my opinion, my most important ministry. It's the one, like I already told the parents, if one kid shows up on Zoom, I'm going to be there. <laughs> Luckily, it's not just one kid, but um, it's... And it is also a very rewarding ministry. You're going to get to hear some of the kids. They had a piece all ready to sing for you. They did sing on the stairs uh, for Christmas Eve, and it was wonderful. But they, they had a piece ready for Sunday mornings. Um, but individual kids are going to get tested and do a, a solo every now and then. So that's coming up. All right. So I am mindful of the time. I just want to say, Rip, that to me... First of all, this was just wonderful, and, and I so appreciate your willing to share deeply. And um, I think that you show in spades the um, characteristics that you identified in your mentors, and um, and we are the beneficiaries of that. So, thank you so much for this, and. Everyone, thank you for your questions, for your coming here. Please come next Tuesday for Katie O'Hare Gibson. Um, and blessings to you all. I hope I didn't forget anything. <laughs>